Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, still, everyone. Welcome to Blue Ridge Prism Summer Meeting. We're just going to give a couple minutes for everyone to roll in and get settled, and we will get started with today's presentation um, with Mark Puckett. So, hold on. And if you'd like to drop uh, your name and where you're calling in from today into the chat, we always love to see um, everyone to know who's in our audience and and geographic representation. Oh. Shout out to Lori in Indianapolis. Love that city. I'm from Indiana originally. Georgia. Lots of quail down in Georgia, this longleaf pine wiregrass plantation. Amazing. Hi to our partners at the Clifton Institute. And Rockbridge Conservation, hello. Hey, Carla. All right, folks, we're just going to give another minute. Hey, Alice Lee, I'm so glad to see you on the call today. Uh, give our folks a few more minutes to log in and get settled in, and we'll go ahead and get started. We had 417 people register for, for today, so no pressure, Mark. <laughs> Hey, William. Huh. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I have a lot of always have a lot of master naturalists and master gardeners on these webinars. So thank you all for your volunteerism and for joining us today. We already have a couple of things in the Q and A. Okay. Oh, Fort Worth, Texas. Hi, Yvonne. Okay, I think uh, we'll go ahead and get started today. So let me, uh, we have just a, a few minutes. So first, I just want to welcome everyone to our uh, Blue Ridge PRISM summer meeting. I'm really pleased that you all have uh, decided to, to join us for an hour and a half to, over your lunch break. Um, really glad to have you. Um, I just want to let you know the meeting is being recorded and we will post the meeting on Blue Ridge Prism's YouTube channel uh, in just the next couple of days. So you'll be able to go back and watch it. And also closed captions are enabled if you need to use that feature. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screen and you can just turn that on and see. Um, my name is Beth Mizell and I am the direct, executive director for Blue Ridge Prism. And I'm really uh, pleased to welcome Mark Puckett with uh, Department of Wildlife Resources to speak to, about quail today. And also joining us is uh, PRISM's President Rod Walker, and uh, he will be giving a brief PRISM update. So I just have a few uh, housekeeping things and event announcements. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you all quickly 
and run through those things and let me hit play. There's like a lot of things on these screens you have to admit. Okay, so welcome our summer meeting. These are not your grandpa's quail, very excited. Um, if you're having audio issues, it seems like uh, we're all getting much, much better at Zoom, uh, but just a few things to check. And also remember that closed caption is enabled. Uh, so if you're having problems, check your audio settings and make sure that Zoom is using the desired headphones or speakers on your computer. Um, I just wanted to, to make a couple of quick announcements about upcoming Blue Ridge PRISM events. We have some um, really exciting things lined up for the rest of the summer. We the, the, Today's presentation with Mark is one of the highlights. Um, our next webinar, uh, we will be doing a deep dive into aquatic invasive plants. Um, so that'll be our brown bag webinar. It's an hour over your lunch break. Come and learn about emergent, aquatic plants, submergent, there's all kinds of aquatic plants. Uh, so it'd be really interesting and, and some new content for us prison folks because we really focus on terrestrial invasive plants and, and less so on the aquatics. Um, I think you're gonna learn a lot about Trapa by Spinoza. Um, and then we also have uh, upcoming invasive plant workshop. The first in a few years, we're back at Blandy, um, at the Blandy work, uh, State Arboretum. We're very excited that they've invited us to host a workshop there. You can sign up on our Eventbrite page. And then we have some upcoming volunteer work days that Tom Sielli will be hosting in Greene County. And uh, we're really excited about this partnership with the Nature Conservancy working at Fernbrook Nature Preserve in Nelson County. And if you haven't been to Fernbrook Nature Preserve, it is a beautiful nature preserve they have an easy hike and a difficult hike and um, it, it's gorgeous um, so please come out and join us in helping to protect a small part of this this nature preserve and to learn about how to manage invasive plants so it's a win-win um, so yeah go to our events page on our website to learn more um, a few zoom tips for everyone please use the q a box to ask your questions Leave the chat for um, you know sharing information or saying hi to another uh, attendee, um, and we're not going to be using the raise hand function today. And we've allowed a lot of time for questions today. And Mark can go to one o'clock with questions. So um, we have we already have a lot of questions teed up for him. But if you think of something or have uh, need some clarification, reach out to us info at blueridgeprism dot or we'll uh, pass the question to Mark, or if you have a question on invasive species management, happy to answer that for you, or check us out on facebook.com and send us a message that way. Um, we're also on other social media platforms, uh, Twitter and Instagram. And if you're not following us on YouTube, uh, you can go to our YouTube channel and follow us there as well, or whatever the, that is, follow something. Um, and I uh, just want to recognize that we're supported by the Virginia Environmental Endowment and supporters like you. And if you made a contribution for today's presentation, we certainly appreciate that that you um, that you did that for us. So thank you. It helps us to keep bringing great programs like that to you. So I'll stop sharing my screen now, and um, I'm going to pass it over to Rod Walker. And as I mentioned, Rod Walker is the president of PRISM and one of the founding members. And he's gonna give us a brief PRISM update on what we've been up to over the past few months. So Rod, take it away. All right, thank you, Beth. Uh, thank you, Mark, for joining us today. The, uh, uh, and thank, uh, thank you all for, for uh, attending. I'm just gonna just take a couple of quick minutes here uh, and, and talk about, uh, you know, really, I'm going to focus on two items in, in particular. There's lots of things we could talk about, like our, you know, our email list is now over 5,000 people, uh, and we've got this great program we started a year ago with two full-time people uh, who are available to meet with you on your properties, uh, and that's really going great as well. Uh, but I'm going to focus, as I say, on, on these two topics here you know, really quickly. Uh, before we can uh, turn it back over to Mark. Uh, so, yeah, legislative successes. Uh, there were two bills uh, just recently signed by the governor uh, 
they're both effective the first of July, so they're you know they're now law. Uh, the the first one was was pretty straightforward uh, and specifically directs the Secretary of Natural Resources and the Secretary of Agriculture and Forestry uh, to make sure that native plant species are being prioritized you know, on state properties. So there's certain activities they're supposed to undertake uh, to, to make sure that state agencies are aware of this uh, and they're actually uh, prior prioritizing and, and using native plants as opposed to non-native plants you know, on state properties. So yeah, HB 2096 uh, has got a variety of great things in it. Uh, so one, one of the challenges we've had, uh, this first item here with, with VDAX, the, that's the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services, uh, up to this point, we've had trouble putting some plants on the noxious weeds list uh, because there are incidental movements of those plants, like uh, they could get bound up in a bale of hay. Uh, and if that happens, uh, then if that's on the, that plant's on the noxious weeds list, then the farmer would have to get a permit to take that bale of hay down the road. Uh, so that was a really a, a procedural impediment to putting a bunch of plants on the noxious weeds list. Uh, this bill has, I believe, solved that problem. Uh, so we'll, we'll now uh, you know, be able to proceed with putting more uh, really nasty plants on the noxious weeds list. Speaking of, of that, then there's a separate list that's published by the Department of Consumer, uh, the Department of Conservation Recreation (DCR). They publish a list that, that for since 19, you know, 2014, has had 90 invasive plants on it. So it hasn't been updated since then. They're working on updating it now. Uh, and this law says, hey, they, they, they need to update this every four years because there's lots more plants that ought to be on that list. Uh, and then, of course, there's also a, a, a provision in here that no state agency will plant, sell, or propagate uh, a plant on that DCR list unless it's for scientific or research purposes. And the last one's kind of my favorite, uh, which is this requires, whether it's a landscape architect, landscape designers, or installers of plants, if they are going to be utilizing a plant on the DCR list of invasive plants, they need to tell the landowner uh, that they're using a plant off the DCR list of invasive plants uh, on, on the theory that you know, most landowners, if they really know that that's what's happening, uh, will probably ask for an alternative. Uh, and so that should really cut down on uh, the, the use of some of these plants because uh, the nursery trade has told us that about two thirds of the stuff that they produce actually gets uh, sold <clears throat> through through these trades people uh, as opposed to retail uh, to the consumers directly. So, so hopefully these things will make a difference you know, going forward. Uh, and uh, yeah, we want to get the word out that the, these things are in play, particularly this last one, uh, so that you know, people are aware uh, that uh, you know, notification is required if, if uh, DCR listed plants are being used. Uh, the the uh, <clears throat> the other thing I'm going to talk about here real quickly uh, is we are in the midst of organizing a three day conference to be held in December. Uh, it turns out it'll be in Charlottesville at the Wool Factory, uh, and the idea here is to convene a working group of somewhere between 50 and 80 people uh, from all over the state, uh, from organizations that have an interest in solving invasive plant problems. Uh, the idea is to produce out of this three day workshop. You know, two to six new initiatives that'll be launched across the state uh, and, and presumably managed by the people who attended the workshop. So uh, this, this is a big deal from our standpoint. We're really trying to step up our game and, and, and really launch statewide initiatives as opposed to being more focused on just the, the 12 counties that we tend to service most of the time. So if, if you represent an organization that would like to be included in this three-day conference, uh, you should let us know and, and, and contact info at blueridgeprism.org. So those, those, those are the, the, the biggest items. And again, I don't want to take too much time here. I want to hear what Mark has to say. So if you have any other questions, again, uh, just send them off, off to us at info at blueridgeprism.org. Uh, and thank you for your attending. I'm looking forward to, uh, again, hearing what Mark has to say. So I'm going to stop here and turn it over. You're on. Well, thank you. Uh, Y'all want me to go ahead? Are you? Yeah. Ready? So, Mark, you can go ahead and get uh, 
sorted okay. and then and I will introduce you okay. and before I make your introduction um, I just wanted to offer a quick correction about some of Blue Ridge Prison's volunteer work days um, I think I, I have on this I had on the screen Fern Brook Nature Preserve that's also a preserve managed by the Nature Conservancy outside of Charlottesville our volunteer work day will be at Fortune's Cove Nature Preserve in uh in nelson county i often get those two mixed up because i spend time often at both of them so um sorry about that tom and sorry uh, for you all for any confusion so thanks tom for texting me about that uh, so with that i would love to introduce mark puckett to you all um, mark is a small game projects leader and private lands biologist manager for the virginia department of wildlife resources in graduate school, Mark studied bobwhite quail in relation to modern agriculture. He specializes in habitat management of forested and agricultural systems. He has served as the past chair of the steering committee of the National Bobwhite Technical Committee and is past president of the Virginia chapter of the Wildlife Society. Since 2010, Mark has helped lead a multi-partner team that works closely with the Virginia Natural Resources Conservation Service, so NRCS, and the Conservation Management Institute of Virginia Tech and Quail Forever. So Mark, welcome and, and thanks again. It sounds like you are the right guy to talk to us about quail management in Virginia. So I'll let you take it away. Well, thank you for the nice welcome. Um, I'm happy to be with you all this morning. I guess, yeah, it's still morning. Uh, they told me how many folks were signed up for this, and I thought they must have been giving away some kind of dramatic door prize or something for everybody who signed <laughs> on this morning, or, or maybe uh, y'all thought I was somebody else. But anyway, I'm going to do my best to give you an entertaining but mostly informative presentation this morning. Um, I've been working with quail since 1992. That's when I started doing my master's work. Uh, so it's been a many years, decades of work, and I've, I've given hundreds of presentations. I've given very few through this media. Uh, I can't see you all. I wish I was in the same room with you so we could interact and I could see how things were going, whether, whether I was putting you to sleep or you were engaged, but I can't. So uh, I, I guess you can see me. Um, my contact information is at the bottom. Email is the best way to contact me. I, I answer all of my emails promptly. And if there's something that I don't cover today, uh, feel free to reach out to me anytime and, um, and I'll do my best to get back with you quickly. Uh, so I'll, I'll explain why I titled this talk, Not Your Grandpa's Quail in a minute, but I wanted to give a shout out to Tall Timbers Research Station and Land Conservancy. If you look at that number at the top, uh, a lot of what we know about quail today, especially what we've learned in the last 25 years or so, has, has, has a core with tall timbers. They're located in Tallahassee, Florida. They do a lot of work in the Red Hills area. But if you look at that one number, 35,000, they, they have had radio transmitters on over 35,000 wild quail. And I think that's unprecedented. They are not the only institution out there. There are a lot of really good quail research institutions uh, in Texas and uh, Mississippi, Missouri, Georgia, North Carolina, Virginia, all over. But Tall Timbers, I think, has led the way for quite some time now. And for those of you that aren't familiar with radio telemetry, just real quickly, as I know we have a whole range of audience members, some of you may know what that means, but for those who, of you who don't, a radio transmitter is a, is a small radio that can be attached to an animal with an individual frequency. So we can radio collar literally hundreds of quail at once, and we have a receiver that we can program to each individual frequency so that we can track each individual animal. And uh, it's used with just about every facet of wildlife research. But what that means is they have put radio transmitters on 35,000 wild quail and they have tracked them and they've also de developed ways to put radio transmitters on quail chicks, which are tiny. And that revolutionized what we know about the small quail. Uh, more recently, GPS is being used and this is gonna revolutionize a lot of what we know as well. 
now they can actually make the GPS transmitter small enough to attach to organisms the size of a quail or a woodcock and track them in real time with the GPS programs. Uh, pretty fascinating work. But anyway, uh, I would like to also say that when I did my master's work, the current CEO and president of Tall Timbers is Dr. Bill Palmer, and he was my mentor in graduate school. <laughs> Uh, he, he was actually a good friend. We're still friends, but uh, we, we're in different circles now. But uh, he, he was my mentor to them, and uh, he got me into bird hunting as well as learning about quail. So just a couple of quick facts. I think it's fascinating. Only about one out of every 15,000 quail live to be six years old. So be happy you're not a quail. Uh, you would probably be long gone by now if you were. Uh, and they're not monogamous. Uh, years ago, folks used to think that they paired off and they were monogamous, but a lot more things are going on with their reproductive systems, which is good. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, some of you probably didn't know that males typically incubate about a fourth of all the quail nests. Sometimes the hen will leave a nest with a male and she'll go have another clutch of eggs. Uh, so this increases their reproductive capacity. Um, and, and the chicks are very uh, precocial. They, they, they can feed and fend for themselves almost immediately after hatching. Uh, they do need to be kept warm until they can develop feathers. And there's a lot of mixing and matching that goes on out there, uh, especially in areas where you have high density populations. But we're not going to spend too much time on that. I'm going to get to the next slide. So why have I called this talk, these are not your grandpa's quail? And I, of course, I, you could take that in a literal or a figurative sense, but quail, their generation time is every year. Basically, you get a new generation of quail every year, and the quail decline has been ongoing for 100 years. I know that might be hard to believe, but the original research done in the 1920s by Herbert Stoddard was done because quail were declining then. And I think the quail population probably peaked in the United States in the decades that followed the Civil War. Uh, but the, the decline in quail populations is not new. Well, the good news is when they undergo a new generation every year, this gives them a chance to adapt and actually evolve. And there is some really recent research that has been done that demonstrates that these animals can evolve a lot faster than previously believed. You know, you hear about geologic time and things taking millions of years, but they can change and sometimes in imperceptible ways to us, they have evolved themselves in a way that increases their survival ability so that they can adapt, you know, animals adapt and change continually. And so what I mean by these are not your grandpa's quail is that if you took a covey of quail from the 1930s and you could could compare those quail to the quail that are here today, they would be very different in ways that we may not notice. And I believe if you took a covey of quail from the 1930s, if you could go back in time and bring that covey of quail to our modern landscape, that covey of quail would survive far less well than a covey that is here now that has adapted to the conditions that exist on our landscape now. So, you know, the modern quail is just not the same quail that your great grandpa hunted decades ago. And they have adapted to at least some of the habitat and the predator conditions that exist today. And that's a great thing. Um, I believe there are places even in Virginia where quail are making a modest recovery. And I believe it's because the ones that are here now are the survivors. These are the generations that have gone through change and survived, and they are better able to survive in the landscape we have now. So it's not just the fact that we are doing a lot of conservation work. It's also the fact that these birds have changed and they're better at surviving under today's conditions, which are not ideal for quail in many places. So there are very few things that a quail does better than die. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if I was there in an audience, I'd normally get a laugh to that, but it is true. They die a lot. 
average annual survival is only 23%, even in an area like tall timbers where the conditions are near ideal for quail. Even under ideal conditions, they rarely have a survival rate higher than about 23 to 25%. And the difference between an increasing or declining quail population is only a few percentage points in annual survival. Now, this is a key thing, and this gives me a lot of hope as well. Tall timbers and others have found that if annual survival in a quail population drops below 15%, that population will decline. But if annual survival can be bumped above 20%, that population will increase. And in between 15 and 20%, it probably holds stable. So, but if you think about that, that is a, an enormous cause for optimism because as a manager, somebody who's managing property and managing habitat for quail, if you can just boost that annual survival up above 20%, you can actually have a quail population that's increasing. Now, that's also kind of tricky math because it's not just a 5% increase. You know, when you go to 15% survival to 20% survival, that's a 25% increase, if my math is correct. And yes, I'm a VT and an NC State grad. So, but, so that, those numbers are a little bit misleading. But anyway, the good news is you don't have to increase annual survival to 50% or 60% if you can just get it above 20% um they can the population can increase so everything we do as a manager is about increasing their survival well the only thing they do is good or better than die is reproduce and so uh, they're they're what's called an r selected species uh, they are used to a heavy rate of loss and they are genetically designed to overcome a high rate of annual loss um, you just have to give them a chance. Uh, but as I mentioned before, the hens may leave a clutch with the male and go nest again. They will re-nest time after time after time until they have a successful nest or they run out of day length, which is usually, I've seen quail setting on eggs in mid-September. Uh, the chances of survival for those quail chicks is much lower than those that were hatched in August because they may not develop flight feathers in time for the cold weather. But anyway, and second, second broods, in other words, a hen may have a successful clutch and then have another clutch and that clutch be successful because their, their nesting season essentially May through September with a peak in June and July. Uh, so there's a lot of opportunity in there for them to re-nest if they lose a nest or even if they have a successful nest. And they've even documented as many as three successful clutches for one female in one season. Uh, the, the season in Florida is a little longer than it is in Virginia. You know, the further north you go, the more condensed that nesting season is. But anyway, they are genetically designed to overcome heavy mortality, which is a good thing. So habitat is the key. And I know I, I sound like a broken record when I talk to folks because what I'd like to say is habitat is the key. It's not the only thing. Uh, there are other things that affect quail populations, disease, uh, predation, uh, you know, overuse of pesticides. There are a lot of things that contribute to a population in any given year, but the foundation is the habitat. And if you don't have that foundation of critical habitat, they simply can't recover from those losses. Um, and it's real simple, you know, uh, I don't work for NASA <laughs> and I'm not a rocket scientist, but quail habitat management is, is very simple. They like thickets, weeds, and brush, you know, and it, it's, it's not complicated in concept. Sometimes it's complicated in application. But if you just remember this one rule from today, remember the rule of thirds. When you're managing quail habitat, they need a third thickets and a third weedy first and second year plant growth and then a one third of plant growth that's a little bit grassier for nesting. Those are the three things they have to have and they need to have those well interspersed. If you look at the photograph there in the, the lower right hand corner, that's on one of our management areas and you can see how those shrub thickets are kind of interspersed between other herbaceous growth 
And yeah, I see some, there are some invasive species in that picture too. Uh, that's something we'll talk about a little bit later. The slide at the top is of an indigo bush hedgerow. That was a planted hedgerow. And I'll talk about that a little bit more later, but many times you don't have to plant anything, but just remember that rule of thirds. Uh, and that that's, that's quail management in a nutshell. So I get this question a lot. Uh, landowners want to know, well, if we create all this habitat, when are you going to bring the quail to us? And I'm not actually sure what that little bird is on the slide, but I've always thought that that looks like a landowner who's fussing at me because I tell them I'm not going to bring them any quail. Um, it's usually not necessary. Now, there could be some exceptions to that, but from what I have seen in the decades that I've done this work, if you get the habitat correct, and in enough quantity and in the right parts of the state, the quail do show up. Now, I made a comment earlier prior to this talk, if you have a 10 acre field in the middle of a hardwood forest in Bath County, Virginia, the quail are not just gonna show up. Uh, there's really no way for them to get there because the landscape they're living in is not conducive to quail. But if you're east of Route 29 and south of Route 66 or certainly south of Route 64, and we've had quail show up in Madison County, uh, Rappahannock County, you know, Culpeper County, we're still seeing quail respond to habitat. Manassas uh, National Battlefield Park has a population of bobwhite quail uh, simply by the size of that park they're able to maintain that population even though they're surrounded by suburbs. But the quail move and folks also used to say, well, they're sedentary, they never move anywhere, but they do move a lot. Uh, they go through what's called a fall shuffle where the cubbies break up and they're just genetically predisposed to move in the four directions of the wind. And then they recombine and mix up and that creates genetic diversity. And then I have what I call the spring fleeing is when the coveys break up in the spring. Now, for those of you that don't know, quail form coveys in the fall of 12 to 15 birds, and they spend the winter together, uh, largely for warmth and protection. They roost together at night. But in the spring, those coveys start to break up and the males and females form pairs, and then they go off to nest and they don't reconvene until fall when the weather starts to get cold again. They've been documented moving over 100 miles, and, and I think that was in Oklahoma. I, I'm not sure the exact state, but they move a lot more. Now, on average, they don't move that much, but they, they do move miles. They can move miles, and I've, we've documented them in Virginia moving five or six miles. I've seen them move a mile in one day. Uh, so, again, most of the time, if you get enough habitat and get it in the right condition, they will they'll find it. They will show up. So we're not going to bring you quail, <laughs> although we are doing some work with that, and Tall Timbers has done a lot of work with relocating wild quail. We can talk a little bit about that more, but I'm, I don't want to focus on that today. So here's the, the landscape context that I talked about. These two photographs were taken in Halifax County, Virginia. I think one was 1950-something, and then the one on the right is from 2012. And they're, they're from exactly the same view in exactly the same county. And that's how much the landscape has changed over the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, you know, back in the 1940s and 50s and even into the 60s, you had a lot of small farms. They were fragmented. There was a lot of uh, diversity in the cropping systems. There was a lot of diversity in timber management. There were small clear cuts, small patch cuts, and a lot of that's changed. We've gone to more intensive agriculture and also more intensive forestry. Uh, neither one of those things are all bad. Uh, I certainly don't wanna give a, a bad name to agriculture or forestry. Uh, we would all be lost without both of those things, but those systems have changed. And so, when a biologist mentions the landscape context, basically that's what we're saying. The landscape itself has changed over the last 60 or 70 years, and that makes a difference. The good news is the modern landscape can be managed very well for quail. It just, I, I, I guess it just takes a little more effort, although we do see a lot of quail on the landscape now just by accident. Uh, timber harvest. Uh, timber regeneration for both rough grouse and quail is important. 
so basically when we regenerate timber, we're just creating a young forest that's eventually going to be an older forest. And that early successional habitat is key to so many things, not just quail. You know, you look at white-eyed vireos, uh, rufous-sided towhees, cardinals, brown thrashers, uh, yellow-breasted chats. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, the species that, that need early successional habitats. So let's talk about thickets for a minute, and I don't want to overburden these. I don't want to spend too much time on these slides, but I think everyone understands what a thicket is. That could be blackberry, uh, sumac, hawthorn, uh, any number of, of low growing shrubs that grow up to about head high. Uh, they form a thicket, and I like to tell people no umbrellas, please. <laughs> If you've ever seen an autumn olive, the way autumn olive grows, and I know y'all have seen it, uh, that's probably one of your all's biggest challenges, but it grows like an umbrella. And it, it appears to offer cover from above, but underneath it, it's a tunnel. And a cooper's hawk or a fox or a bobcat, once they get underneath that autumn olive, they can move around and catch the quail or the grouse or whatever may be under there. So when we talk about thickets, we want stem density at the ground level that the quail can get through, but that it makes it difficult for the predators to get through. And if you look at that slide at the bottom, that's a plum thicket on one of our wildlife management areas. And you can see what I mean. There's a lot of stems down at the ground level, but still plenty of room for a quail to run around in there. Not so much for a hawk to fly through. Uh, indigo bush, wax myrtle, uh, lots of things will do. I mean, even young hardwoods, even young, even young hard, uh, oak trees uh, in the right arrangement. And those thickets should be about 30 by 50 feet on average. And again, well distributed throughout an area, uh, not all in one place. So when we talk about having a third of your land in thickets, that doesn't mean that this third is in thickets and then this third is in weeds and then this third is in grasses. That means that all of those things are distributed throughout that property. Um, I hope that hope that makes sense. If you could fly over parts of Texas uh, at a low level, you would see the exact distribution of that kind of shrubby cover that's needed. Uh, it's a little harder to see in our landscape. And so how to develop thickets? Well, you can plant them, um, but that's time and labor intensive. I've spent many hours using a dibble bar to plant shrubs, and there's a lot of things I would rather do. <laughs> Than, than spend a day with a dibble bar planting shrubs. I tell folks, usually it's not necessary to plant. Um, it's interesting because folks will call me and they'll tell me, I've been bush hog in this field for 15 years. What do I need to plant for quail? And I'm always like, well, first of all, what are you bush hogging down? You know, what, what is there now? Because chances are some of that's really good. And the other thing is, if you plant shrubs into that substrate, all those things that you've been mowing are going to come up anyway. And then you're going to have to deal with how do you keep the things separated from the shrubs you planted. So there are places like in a crop field where you want to speed things along. If you wanted to uh, create a, a hedgerow on a crop field, maybe planting shrubs would be good or, or something that would work well. But a lot of times it's not, it's not necessary. You can uh, fell trees out into a field edge and the songbirds will perch on those and their droppings have seeds in them that have been scarified through their digestive process and they'll they'll make an instant thicket for you in no time at all. All you have to do is drop a couple of trees out into your field and walk away. Uh, and at some point that will be a nice thicket. And I know y'all have seen this. I'm probably preaching to the choir a little bit, but it doesn't have to be complex. This is just an example of where that's happened. You've had a, a tree fall out into a field and mother nature happened. <laughs> and now you have a thicket. And if you had one of those about every 300 feet around the field, you would have a lot of good cover. Uh, another thing to remember about thickets is quail don't like to be more than about 150 feet away from a thicket at any given time. Now that's about as far as a person can throw a softball. By the way, a quail is about the size of a softball. So. <laughs> Uh, but if you keep that in mind when you're working on your property, uh, how to space those thickets out, just think about how far you can throw a softball and in the middle you have thickets on either side of you at that distance. 
but yeah, it's easy to create thickets. Uh, you just have to give them a little bit of time. And uh, just to emphasize that, um, they've actually done studies where they had radioed quail and they used a falconer, somebody that had a trained falcon, and they would release these quail and they would see how the quail reacted. The falconer would release the falcon and they watched how the quail behaved and they went immediately. They flew at a very low level as fast as they could fly into the thickest patch of cover that was available to them. And so that, that's why they need those thickets. If you think of it as a shell game, you know, if you're playing a shell game and you have a, a quarter and you only have two walnut hulls, it's not very hard. But if you have 30 and the walnut hulls are the thickets for quail, if you have a lot of them, then it makes it much more difficult for the predator to, to find them. So I hope that makes sense as well. Protective cover is the number one predator defense. And uh, predator control is practiced and is important on, on some of the larger quail properties, but it doesn't have to be done. It can enhance quail survival, but it is, again, the habitat that is the key. Uh, now, when we talk about habitat basics too, and remember this is the second of those thirds, weedy first and second year growth. Um, I have ragweed allergies, but I love ragweed, and there is absolutely nothing better for brood rearing than ragweed. Um, if you look at my photograph here, that's mostly partridge pea and ragweed, both native. Uh, both of them are excellent at attracting insects, which quail chicks have to have to survive. They're also both excellent at producing seeds that uh, serve as, as winter food. So brood rearing cover doubles as winter feeding cover. You don't have to think about them as separate things. They're, they're one and the same. Um, I'm going to slip on through to this next slide and explain the bare ground concept. You'll hear quail managers talk about the fact that quail need bare ground, but we're not talking about these big open patches of bare ground. That, that's not what we mean. What we're talking about are these small patches of bare ground underneath the canopy of annual weeds like uh, ragweed and partridge pea and others. So rather, when you're looking at this slide, you see this big open patch, but concentrate more on the small openings that are underneath that canopy of vegetation. And by the way, that is a lot of ragweed and partridge pea in those photographs. Uh, just as a fact, uh, maybe more useless information, but ragweed is more nutritious than corn on an ounce per ounce basis. And it is one of the number one food items for quail in Virginia through food habits studies. Uh, it's important even into January. And then things like partridge pea that have harder seeds that persist later into, into the winter become more important later in the season. So how do we create weedy areas? Well, there's, it, it takes some sort of disturbance. Uh, that could be prescribed fire. That could be rotational disking. Uh, it can even be um, the proper use of cattle grazing. Uh, there's more and more emphasis being put on the fact that it, when cattle grazing is done correctly, it can actually, they can actually serve as the disc in the fire, or they can enhance those practices. It's all about not overgrazing, but anyway, it takes some disturbance. And I know what a lot of you all are thinking is that disturbance always opens the door to invasive species, which is true. Uh, we'll talk about that more in a little bit. So, you know, it, it well, I'll get to that. But uh, disking, it, it's all done in rotation. In other words, if you have 60 acres, you're trying to manage 20 of it each year with some sort of disturbance. And by the way, a quail's range is, is somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 to 60 acres. Uh, they do better than that on the plantations in the deep south because they do a lot of things that are beyond the means of most landowners. But if you have 25 to 50 acres in an average quail range, you need to manage about a third of that every year, either by disking it or burning it, or again, some potential use of rotational grazing. Uh, you know, you may also have to do some spot spraying and a few other things, but in concept, it's very simple. If you're starting with idle cropland, all you have to do is do nothing and begin rotational disking and just let the weeds happen. 
Uh, if you're starting with pasture haylands, you've got to kill those non-native invasives. Uh, you've got to kill the things like fescue and Bermuda grass first before you start disturbance because that disturbance just makes them mad. Uh, if you burn and disc uh, Bermuda grass or, or fescue or, or Johnson grass or other things like that, it just makes them mad. Uh, you know, there are ways to handle those without herbicides. I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to say that can't be done, but it is difficult and time consuming. It involves cover cropping and repeated disturbance and cover cropping. Uh, and if you're starting with pine timber or even with hardwoods, you have to thin those stands heavily and then start either doing some rotational burning. That's the best thing. And in a cutover situation, uh, a clear cut, new clear cuts are usually going to be good for quail for the first two to six years or so. And then they're going to start closing canopy depending on how they've been managed. I don't want to get too much into the nuts and bolts of that today, but we can get a private lands biologist out to your land if you are interested in that. Uh, just contact me and we will get the right biologist there to help you assess what you have and make a plan for how to manage it. Uh, and then nesting cover. This is the easiest one of all. Basically, you don't have to manage specifically for nesting cover because if you're managing on a three-year rotation, that second year or third year, the nesting cover is just going to show up on its own. You, you go from that transition to mostly annual weeds to a mixture of annual and perennial weeds and grasses and then to the thicket stage. So nesting cover is usually not a limiting factor. Uh, we've been guilty decades ago of overselling uh, the dense stands of native grasses. Uh, it, it, nesting cover was overemphasized in the 90s and early 2000s, and we've realized that, generally speaking, that grassy cover is usually not a, a limiting factor. You never need more than 30%, 40% grass, even within the nesting cover. And too much grass is worse than too little. Uh, sometimes when it gets too thick, we can, we can help you with how to reduce the thickness of that. And then, then the nesting cover also uh, often doubles as night roosting cover as well. Okay, so, and so what about invasives? I mean, you, you all are focused on invasives and that's a great thing because they are everywhere. As you all know, it is uh, ubiquitous uh, and it seems to be getting worse. Now we have things like still grass, we have arthraxon, we have wavy leaf basket grass, we have, uh, you, you know, the list goes on and on. I look at DCR's list and it's frightening. Um, unfortunately, some of those things we brought upon ourselves. Uh, when you look at that sign that says Autumn Isle planted in 1969, there's no denying that that shield that was on there was Department of Game and Animal <laughs> Fisheries. And for years, uh, folks created feeder fields and we did some things that uh, seemed like a great idea at the time. Uh, those, those folks were all well intended and worked very hard and did a lot of great things. Uh, but like all of us, they made a mistake or two. Uh, that picture on the left is my yard and that is a hedgerow, well, field border. I, I like to practice what I preach. I let lots of portions of my yard just grow up. Uh, but that is all Cerecia lespedeza, and you'll notice it's brown, and that's because I sprayed it. Uh, I just took a backpack sprayer uh, when it was flowering, and yeah, I know there's folks that talk about different ways to control Cerecia, but when I spray it when it's flowering with glyphosate, it sets it back significantly. Uh, the trick to Cerecia is it's not going to, you're not going to deal with that in one it's going to take more than one treatment. But anyway, so my point about what about invasives, does that mean we just don't manage? I mean, do we give up? Uh, do, do we just not try to promote good things out of a fear of, of bad things showing up? I don't think so. I think uh, we have to be judicious in how we do these things, but it doesn't mean that because we have invasive species, we need to stop managing. At least that's, that's my opinion. So, so the key to it is scouting. If you're going to manage a property, obviously you want to find the places that have the least invasive issues. If you, if, and hopefully not, it's hard to find that now, uh, but you definitely, before you start disking and burning and doing those kinds of things, you want to take stock of what's there 
and anticipate those problems and then treat those problems beforehand. Um, you know, if you, if you treat after you've planted, then sometimes there's very few things you can do that will work. So avoid the worst areas. Uh, I always tell folks, it's just like fighting fire. If you get a spot over, you attack that spot over and do it aggressively and put it out. Um, invasive plants are the same way. If, if you don't have Japanese stilt grass and you see a 10 by 10 patch of it on your land, you better kill it now. <laughs> you know, you have to get ahead of these things. It's a whole lot easier to get ahead of them than it is to try to catch up. Uh, I know sometimes that's not possible, uh, but it is, sometimes it is. Uh, cleaning equipment and avoid moving bad stuff around. I, I think a lot of uh, invasives get moved on bush hogs. Uh, folks that mow in the fall after the seed has already set and they're moving that seed around uh, very bad. It, speaking of mowing, in my opinion, it's always better to mow in the late winter or early spring um, because it leaves cover there all winter long rather than if you mow in September, nothing's going to grow back till spring. But you just have to be conscious about what you're moving around and you have to think before you plant. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, even recently we're, we're guilty of planting some things that aren't, that aren't native. Um, Rod talked about the governor's directive for invasive plants and, you know, that, that's a good thing. Uh, some, some adjustments need to be made. But anyway, don't be afraid to manage because there's invasives out there. You know, I just don't like the idea of, of doing nothing. So take a good long look at that slide. Uh, that's all you need to know about pine timber management. It's all right there in that slide. <laughs> that's how open the pines need to be and that's what the understory needs to look like. Uh, and I'm not watching my time. I hope, I hope I'm not running over on time. I'll try to speed things up a little bit, but pines have to be open 40 to 50 square foot of basal area. And that lets in enough sunlight to, so that they can be managed for quail. So just remember that view. They're also called the firebird. They don't call quail the firebird for nothing, uh, at least in the southeast where it's so moist and uh, vegetation grows so fast, it takes fairly frequent use of fire. Now, I know some of you don't like fire. There are things that can be done if you, if you don't want to burn, but we are going to talk about fire just a little bit. Fire frequency, basically that's how often you burn. Uh, what is the return interval? And for quail, it needs to be at least every two to three years. Don't fall behind on the frequency, even if it means increasing the scale or changing the season of the burn because it's the frequency of the fire that's most important to quail. This is a stand of property that uh, is owned by Department of Conservation and Recreation down in Sussex County. And that stand that you're looking at, it was burned nine times within an 18 year period. Uh, and the plant diversity in there is incredible. Uh, there were 25 different species of legumes and I can't remember the total number of species of wildflowers. There were quail calling there. So one fire won't, won't do it. It helps, it starts it, but fire has to be applied through time to have a maximum positive effect for wildlife. So. Uh, going back to that slide of those pines, if you're going to thin those pines that open and you don't plan to burn, you're probably better off not to thin them that open uh, because they will grow in very quickly with little pine seedlings if, if they're not going to be burned. And so fire scale, that's very simply just the size of the burn units. Are you burning 50, 50 to 60 acre blocks are ideal? Ideally, you don't burn in units more than 150 to 200 acres. Um, if you're burning huge chunks of land in the late winter and early spring that remove so much cover uh, during the height of the hawk migration that it can have a negative impact. It's, it's a balance. How do you get enough burning done without burning too much? Some years you may have to burn in larger units to get caught up. Uh, but if possible, burning in those smaller units is best. 
And fire season, that's just when you burn. Is it winter? Is it late winter? Is it spring? Is it late summer? Or is it fall? There's a lot of work now that shows that fall fire or even late summer fire, even in August, uh, when the conditions are right, uh, works really well at controlling a lot of the hardwood sprouts and the pine saplings that tend to grow in under open hardwoods or open pines. And going back to that pine slide, you can do the same thing with hardwoods. Um, typically with hardwoods, we don't thin them that heavily initially. It's kind of a, a shock to the system, but you can manage open oak and open hardwood stands very similar to pine stands. Uh, so I don't want to give the impression that it's just for pines. Um, that being said, the site you pick should be the drier, less productive sites for timber. Um, we've learned some lessons that when you're managing on a site that's perfect for growing oak trees, it's hard to turn it into an oak savanna. Fire season continued. Usually it takes some growing season fire to help control the woody growth. I think the best thing that was said to me was plan to burn as much as you can from winter to spring to fall and start burning as soon as the weather allows it. And chances are some of the seasonality will take care of itself. Uh, but again, don't fall behind on the frequency. And that's true for the disking as well. And so this is a growing season fire and I think it's counterintuitive to some folks to wonder why we're trying to kill all those little hardwoods and pines underneath that pine stand. But from a quail standpoint, you need the herbaceous growth, the waist high and below, a lot of the annual weeds and uh, you know some of the perennial weeds and a few of the shrub patches. But if you don't get ahead of the maple and the poplar and the sweet gum and the young pines, uh, very soon that entire understory is gonna be shaded out and it just, just won't be high quality wildlife habitat. So that fire, this picture was from a fire on one of our management areas. I think this was in mid-May uh, and it did a good job. You can see how it's controlling a lot of that hardwood sapling growth. Um, folks ask about, are we destroying nests during this time of the year? Uh, occasionally, but research has shown is, is not that often. It does happen. Uh, it is a short-term loss for a long-term gain, but you could accomplish the same thing. And I've heard, I've heard others say this much better than I'm able to say it. Um, by the way, if you're really intensely interested in habitat management, you need to Google Dr. Craig Harper and you need to become familiar with his work. Uh, he's got some excellent publications out about all of this and he's a gifted communicator, but he, he made the point in a talk I heard not long ago that you can accomplish the same thing with a fall fire and not worry about burning up nests. So, you know, given the choice, it may be better to burn in the late summer or fall but you don't always have a choice. So it's a short, short term loss for a long term gain is the way I look at it. Because if you do nothing, there won't be any nests there in five years because there won't be any nesting habitat there. So, you know, you've got to weigh that out too. Uh, and so just real quickly about the importance of small clearings within a timbered stand. This is something Tall Timbers has done a lot of work on all the light blue, um, rectangles or uh, not all of them are rectangles, but those are small fields that we are creating within thinned pine stands and even within longleaf pine stands. Uh, and we will manage those small clearings for brood habitat by either disking or burning or something like that. But so just keep in mind within your timbered areas, it, it is good to have some small clearings that you can manage. Aglands opportunity abounds, field borders. These are two good pictures of field borders that were just allowed to grow. They basically, they just quit planting crops on those areas and let the weeds come up. Uh, the wider the better. And also if you're gonna have a field border or a hedgerow, don't put it over near your 200 year old hardwood stand. Put it next to where your clear cut's gonna be or put it next to your crop field maximize the amount of early successional cover in a, in a small area. Um, it does much more good, um, more begets more, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Lots of opportunities on ag lands. Uh, and I hope I'm not going too fast, but I am, I am aware of the time here. Um, 
Hunting effects, just real quickly, uh, folks used to say hunting just affected the uh, surplus, but we do know that, that land can be over hunted even for small game. Um, the goal for hunting is not to over hunt an area. Uh, you'd like to keep the hunting mortality in a quail population not to exceed about 15% of that population. So basically we just advise folks don't hunt the same place over and over and over again. Uh, hunt an area and then rest that area and and you meet as a hunter you should find multiple areas and be able to move around from place to place so that you don't uh, overdo it. Okay well yeah and so I wanted to save a lot of time for questions. I hope I didn't go through that too fast but so the take-homes quail are adaptive and they can survive if you give them a chance. Uh, they're very good at reproducing. They will find your property if you create enough cover for them. And if you don't have enough, go in with your neighbors. Uh, the more the merrier from a quail standpoint. The more acreage you can dedicate to it, the higher chances of your success. Uh, quail management never stops. Um, we're talking about early successional species, plant species management, and something has to be done to keep it in that early successional stage. So it's just perpetual. Um, you know, even at my place, uh, I do everything I can with a riding lawn mower and a sawhead weed eater and a backpack sprayer. Uh, I do everything I can do, uh, but my neighbors are doing things as well. So it is possible, even if you have a smaller acreage, you can do a lot of good. Uh, and I will say, even if you don't get quail, even on a smaller acreage, you are benefiting the pollinating insects, many of the songbird species, rabbits, uh, are much easier to manage for on a smaller property than quail are. And all of those are good things. Habitat first before you spend money on a lot of other things. Uh, prescribed fire is, is very useful and it's also very inexpensive. If you learn how to do it yourself, uh, prescribed fire, you can treat more acres with fire at a lower cost than with any other thing you can do. The startup cost, getting your fire lines in, getting the equipment, it's a little expensive on the startup but over time, it's very economical. Uh, you can also, uh, and again, be conservative on the hunting harvest. And then the good news is for all of this habitat management, there are federal programs that will provide incentive payments or cost share payments. And usually uh, you, you break even on those. Uh, if you do the work yourself, you might even make money. Uh, if you hire the work done, usually it you break even or maybe go into the hole a little bit, but uh, it does require an application process. We have a team of six private lands biologists that can come out and not only help assess your land, but also help you enroll, enroll in those programs if you're interested in doing that. So um, let's see here. Oh yeah, so <laughs> I put that on for questions. And that's me, that's how I feel in my job most days, overwhelmed and inadequate. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but, but anyway, uh, but that's all the my formal presentation and I hope I've left us enough time for uh, some questions. Uh, I think it's a little after 12.30, so. Yes, we have plenty of time for questions, Mark. That was fabulous. And, and I think most of us in the conservation uh, space feel just like you do um overwhelmed <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> so yeah. that's a perfect yeah. analogy um and and just so you know i chuckled many times during your presentation <laughs> you, so I, i'm sure uh, everyone else in the audience did as well, well. good <laughs> yeah okay. so you want i guess um, i can stop sharing my screen and yeah yeah just see what That'd see what kind of questions we have yeah i'll see so, how that <laughs> we'll go ahead and um, I'll just start with some general, some of the general quail related questions. Um, we had a really good question about what do they eat? What do quail eat? Oh, oh yeah. Well, they eat a lot of seeds uh, from legumes, a lot of legume seeds, a lot of seeds from flowering plants, but when they eat a lot of insects as well, a huge number of insects, um, insects, especially in the summer, and especially for the quail chicks. So 
uh, when I was talking about the ragweed being such a fantastic plant, it, it's covered up with insects that the quail chicks can eat, but it's also producing that really nutritious seed. So, uh, and beggar weeds, things like uh, stick tights, the little uh, Florida, you know, beggar weeds with the little bean pods, those are really preferred. They do also eat, uh, they'll eat acorns, very small acorns and acorn fragments that are left over from deer foraging or from squirrels foraging. I, I, I've had quail that had nothing but acorn in their crop. And then of course they do eat soybeans, leftover soybeans and corn and those kinds of things. But basically they have a huge diversity in their diet. They eat hundreds of different types of seeds okay. and, and insects as well. And insect. So yeah. back to that diversity in the habitat is so important. So they have lots of different food options. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then uh, another question, a fun fact, uh, uh, about quail, um, I guess. Is it true that they can only fly about 100 yards from Ann? How far can well, quail fly? They, they can fly farther than that. They're definitely not okay. long distance flyers, but I've seen uh -huh. them fly. I've seen them fly multiple hundreds of yards to get away from a, of a hawk trying to get to one of those thickets. Uh, but they do fly in short bursts. Uh, those, those quail I was talking about watching or tracking that quail that moved a mile in a day, it was flying in short increments. It would fly and then stop and then fly and stop again, but probably several hundred yards. I don't have an exact figure, but mm -hmm. you know, more than a hundred yards, but probably less than five or 600 yards. Yeah, they're gonna fly as far as they can if a uh, Cooper Hawk is after them or something. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Um, thank you for that. And another good question uh, about quail. Do they migrate at all during the winter? I mean, you mentioned that they even we need wintering habitat, um, but do they yeah. are they local migrants at all or what do they do? Well, they'll they'll move in response. In other words, their summer range may not always be exactly what their winter range is. Um, I think that big movement that I was talking about out west was a what I would call a, a short range migration in response to the food availability. Uh, they were they probably had some pretty good brood ring area that wasn't producing the winter food they needed, and, or they moved to an area that where there was a cropping system. Uh, out west, they have milo and a lot of soybean, so there's more availability to grains out there. But they're they're not migratory in the sense that we would think of that. Uh, but it wouldn't be uncommon for their winter range to be a mile or so away from their summer range. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we did also have some questions about uh, that were pre-submitted, and and people expressed that they used to hear Bob White all the time and they wondered if they were in trouble. Can you talk about some of the threats, specific threats to, to quail? Uh, I think we really touched on the key that uh, the habitat is key, but can you talk about some yeah. of the other threats to them? Why well, they're in trouble? you know, it, the, I guess they're in the most trouble because will they be able to adapt as fast as the landscape changes? And that's always where you have species that get into enormous trouble when they can no longer adapt to the way the landscape changes. Now here in Virginia or in the southeast, as long as we have some timber harvest and some agriculture, and then we also have some folks managing for them, I think they're going to be fine. But you know, catastrophically, things could happen that change the timber markets or took away something that was beneficial to them by accident, and that would be a huge blow to them. There's a lot of work going on with the neonicotinoid pesticides uh, or insecticides. Mm -hmm. I know there's some concern that it's not so much that it's uh, a direct impact, but more so a reduction in the insect availability so that the forage base is declining. So there's, those are the kinds of things we really need to keep an eye on. And I know that's true for pollinators as well. Mm -hmm. um, It'll be interesting to see how that plays out over time. But I, I just think human population growth, I know that's kind of a cop out, but that's where all of these pressures come from. Uh, we have to have these products. Uh, if you've never heard of a guy named Norman Borlaug, <laughs> you go and Google Norman Borlaug and you'll understand how we're feeding the world today through intensive agriculture, as opposed to 50 years ago when people didn't think we would ever feed this many people on the planet. So, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, habitat declined through all of those factors. And then 
you know, when you look at declines in amphibians and songbirds and insects, you have to wonder what's there that we're missing, you know, is there something that we're missing uh, that could be having effects? But again, I go back to the habitat's the only thing we can really control very well. Mm -hmm. And that it, they have to have that to be able to overcome all these other things. Yeah, and I think that might be a good um, segue into a, a, some a group of questions we had about attracting quail and and how they might do in suburban areas. You know, that edge of human, yeah. pop, right. you know, our expansion into more natural and rural yeah. areas. And um, are there things that people get, can do to support quail in in those? environments or is it just not the right place for quail well that, that was an interesting question because i've observed rabbits and of course i'm a small game biologist so i do a lot with rabbits and squirrels as well as quail and in, uh, in observing rabbits they adapt very well to some of the suburban uh practices uh you know i was uh visiting home over the weekend in a subdivision and the rabbits were everywhere just because the landscaping folks used would harbor rabbits and they and rabbits can eat grass and clove things <laughs> you know the a rabbit's never more than a nose away from food uh, which is different for quail and so rabbits and squirrels have adapted so well to the suburban areas just because of the differences in the way they use the landscape quail don't do so well mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting out west that california quail or what folks call valley quail out there they do roost and inhabit subdivision areas but they roost mm -hmm. in trees and that's one huge difference between them and quail is that they roost mm -hmm. in trees and they are in larger mm -hmm. groups uh, so they seem to have adapted more to humans but the bob white you know if it's on the edge of a suburb like i was talking about manassas battlefield park you know they're surrounded by suburbs and and development but, but manassas is big enough several thousand acres that it can still support quail but mm -hmm. if you're in a neighborhood and you just have smaller yards and you don't have that much quail just don't really do that well there so okay yeah. that's a very helpful answer thank you um, and I, I know this is a really difficult question to answer because it's really all about the habitat, but um, many questions about just the minimum number of acres necessary to create the habitat to, to support a population of quail. Do you have some guidelines? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a very good question, and we get that a lot, and I don't like to discourage folks, but I also like <laughs> to be, be honest with them. Uh, you yeah. know, 25 to 50 acres. And that's not, to, it, again, it goes back to what landscape you're in. Uh, if you're mm -hmm. in a rural part of Southside Virginia or Southeastern Virginia or any rural part in the Piedmont or Coastal Plain, chances are your property, even if your property isn't big, it might be adjacent to lands that are big enough uh, that could support. Look, for example, you might manage a five acre field for brood rearing cover, and that might be next to your neighbor's 100 acre clear cut. And so what you're doing might enhance the quail on, on their place. But if it was just your five acres, the quail may not be there. Uh, so I, I tell folks 25 to 50 acres within a, a decent landscape. Um, and you can probably have some success. Um, that's not to say that they wouldn't use a smaller property from time to time. But that's that's mm -hmm. kind of where I to start that's the size of a covey's range typically and even in a good landscape 25 to 50 acres is a, is okay. a good starting point okay thank you for that and so let's um kind of shift uh some of the questions into to habitat and we had some really specific questions to um you know their their land and um i just want to kind of take some of those maybe general questions okay. you 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 did point out that if you're on top of a mountain surrounded by forest you're it's going to be really hard to to get quail um, because of habitat connectivity yeah. um so we had a really interesting question um where do quail find natural habitat in the absence of human management well uh, that's an excellent question um yeah you know as you go further west in the country uh, when you get into the arid regions and uh, 
they require so much less management. In other words, like parts of Texas where they don't receive so much rainfall, the vegetation grows much slower. So there's huge tracts of states like Texas and uh, Oklahoma uh, and even Kansas that probably don't require when we talk about quail in the east, that two to three year rotation is because everything grows so fast here. So here in the absence of human, in the, in the absence of, um, I can't find the word I, I need, in the absence of intentional quail management in the east, it's timber clear cutting and timber mm -hmm. thinning uh, and site preparation burning. That, that is what I call the accidental quail habitat. That's where they're, they're surviving here in the east. Uh, you know, quail range all the way into northern South America and uh, in Central America, Bob White quail even in Cuba. Um, I'd, I'd love to know what the population is like there. I've never really heard, but uh, mm. that all the land there burns during the dry season. You know, in those parts of the world, they have a dry season and a rainy season. So the man, the, a lot of that land just gets managed by accident. Uh, but here in the east, it, it is the clear cutting and the timber thinning that's producing a lot of that mm -hmm. early successional habitat. Yeah, and, and it's very different today than before, um, you know, pre-European settlement when land was responding to um, uh, in, uh, <laughs> I've lost my words too. <laughs> Um, you know, different practices by uh, the native peoples that were here, but then also huge natural disturbance events, fire yeah. that go, would go for days across the right fuels, um, yeah. huge like megafauna, like the bison that were here that that create these pockets of disturbance and and exactly. and and we and passenger pigeons. Um, so we had this successional habitat that we don't have these things here anymore. That, right. that are naturally creating that habitat for the quail. So um, we have to uh, intervene and, and make that happen. So yeah. uh, take inspiration from the native peoples that were here. So, yep. um, okay, well, thank And that was a great question. Thank you so much. Um, so we had a, uh, some questions about, we talked about what quail eat but what are some native plants that we should think about uh, maybe specifically to, if, if someone wants to, to plant uh, native species to support quail, what are some good ones that they should look at? Well, my, my go-to is, is partridge pea and ragweed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm, okay. I've started to recommend a mixture of that, about a pound of partridge pea and about eight to 10 pounds of ragweed per acre sown in the late winter. Uh, to early spring. Those, those are two go-tos. Uh, just a, a diverse wildflower mix can be good at attracting insects. Uh, Shrub-wise, sumac, plum is excellent. Um, blackberry is very good. You usually don't have to plant those. <laughs> but uh, And then the beggar weeds, the native beggar weeds, some of these seeds are hard to get. They're, they would be excellent to plant, but the seeds are expensive and a little bit difficult to get. Uh, some of the native Lespedezas like slender Lespedeza and uh, roundhead Lespedeza would be good. Uh, you know, for years we planted a lot of Korean and Cove Lespedeza, and I know that's controversial now. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but native plants that function like those plants. Uh, trying to think of some others that just pop into mind, but the beggar weeds, the partridge pea, the native Lespedezas and the ragweed would be, and some of the sunflowers are, are also excellent. Uh, some of the native sunflowers can be very good too. Okay, good. And um, so we had some questions related to, to agriculture. And uh, so I'll just read this one from Sybil. Um, I have 30 acres of field and hay surrounded by 100 acres of hardwood. Which is better, hay or soybeans? I mean, the entire field uh, that's required to switch to soybeans. Is there a negative for quail and other wildlife? Um, so I, I think, uh, you know, a hay field or soybean field, what's going to be the most beneficial and or negative for the quail? 
is us like is that like an either or which which I is think better so. or? We, yeah and we had a, we had several questions about I think I, um, I think I converting hay fields to agriculture um mm -hmm. and and things like that so maybe it really gets at which crop and associated farming practices support quail the most yeah that's, that's a better way to phrase a question that's a good question. I'd have mm -hmm. to think about it a little bit, but you know, soybeans can make pretty good quail habitat at certain times, but mm -hmm. they need to be near some sort of cover. So it's not mm -hmm. the soybeans in and of themselves. Uh, quail will bug and feed. Once the soybeans close canopy, it makes some decent brood rearing cover, especially if it was planted no-till into some wheat stubble. Uh, and hay, normally the hay that we see is, is too dense for quail. When you're talking about fescue hay or even Bermuda grass hay in the coastal plain, it's usually just too dense for quail. So if you were looking at it from that standpoint, I, I would say a soybean field would be better for them than that hay field. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking about a hay field that's native grass hay that uh, maybe is also being managed with some rotational grazing from time to time that could potentially create some habitat and you know there are grassland birds that benefit from large fields of grasses uh, this is where i'm not as strong in terms of something like a grasshopper sparrow uh, a grasshopper sparrow may do better in a hay field that, or a meadowlark may do better in a hay field than a quail would. So it, again, it depends on the species. But speaking just for quail, I guess I would have to give the nod to the soybeans over the hay field. <laughs> I, if, if I'm understanding that question correctly, yeah. I hope that I am. I, I, sure. Yeah, I yeah, I probably should have uh, phrased that. Um, <laughs> A little better, so apologies there. But I think well, you uh, kind of got yeah. to the to the heart of the the agricultural related questions. Um, okay. We had a, a couple questions and a, a follow up question about the quail. Are they native? You you did mention that they were present. Are they native oh, to yeah. Virginia, North America? Yes. Oh native. yeah, ab absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. Colinas, Virginianus. This is where they were first named by, well, the New World, oh, or the Old yeah. World folks. Uh, the Europeans first named mm -hmm. them here in Virginia. And okay. yes, they're, they're native here. They, they, in fact, their range went all the way up into southern Maine, Wisconsin, and then runs way down into Mexico. So they're very widespread. If you get mm -hmm. the structure of the habitat right, they can survive. They <laughs> so, can, yeah. It's that yeah. Hab habitat is key. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to do just a couple more questions, Mark, and um, because we are Blue Ridge Prisms, I'm going to touch on invasives. Um, okay. We did get, we, we actually talked about this before we hopped on the call today. Uh, there's evidence that birds and animals are beginning to eat spotted lantern fly. Um, is there any evidence that quail would eat this pest? That's a good question. I haven't seen that evidence, but they eat insects. And so, you know, and they have a wide range of insects they eat. I don't know. I've read a little bit about the spotted lantern fly. I think they lay their eggs on, on the sides of trees. Like, uh, Tree heaven. Yeah. That's right. Tree of heaven. And yeah. I don't know much about the larval form or anything, but if a quail can reach it, they'll probably eat it. They'll probably, they're pretty big <laughs> they, and juicy. So I would yeah, think that they might yeah, eat like, them, if, but more I'm of an not, opportunistic interaction yeah. than a, they would seek them out and help impact right. the populations. Um, okay. And then any, I'm not promoting invasive plants, but I think this is a question of curiosity. Are there any invasive plants um, of value to Bob White? Yeah, I mean, when you look at all those Lespedezas that I talked about, we for years we did plant a lot of uh, Virginia 70 Lespedeza and bicolor Lespedeza, which are not actually native, uh, but the quail love the seeds and they do very well in those areas. Also the Korean and the Cove Lespedeza, which is an annual Lespedeza, uh, they, do, they do eat a lot of those seeds and those are the ones that come to mind mostly for me uh, for decades. Uh, those those Lespedezas were promoted. And again, the quail 
uh, do well with them. So uh, you, you can still find areas on some of our military bases that were heavily planted to Virginia 70 or bicolor Lespedeza. And the quail use, they use the heck out of it, but it's, it also has become uh, a management issue for them. So it's, um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. I'm not promoting it. Just, uh, they were <laughs> curious and would quail eat Japanese stilt grass or be able to use Japanese stilt grass in some way? Um, I'm going to assume not in a, a forested setting. It's not the right habitat, but stilt grass does move into the right open habitat. Yeah. I, as from what I know about the seeds, they're very, very small, and the plant itself, they wouldn't eat that. The, my only guess would be around the edges of a stilt grass area, they may be able to bug. There may be insects there that they can capture, but stilt grass grows so dense that it would be hard for them to move through it. So as a whole, yeah. I think it, I think it's a negative. Yeah, it's. I don't believe they would use it much or benefit okay. from it. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, I think to, to wrap up, I just want to make sure that people know how, how do they get in contact with a private lands biologist to come and talk about quail and, and uh, think about some of the cost share programs that are available. How do they sign up for that? Well, the easiest thing from today is just if you, if you got my email address, because a lot of them, uh, they can send an email to me and then I'll get them in touch with the proper uh, biologist that covers their area. It's also on our website. If you type in Virginia DWR slash quail, um, you have to do a little looking around on, on that site, but you can find a coverage area map with all of their contact information on there as well and showing the counties where they cover. Okay. But yeah, the simplest thing is just, uh, just send a note to me and I'll get them in touch with the right biologist. Okay. And uh, so I just dropped a, a link in the chat for everyone to the DWR website. And I, I will say that um, oh, I did, yeah. did have to dig around for that information a while back, but now I have it bookmarked. Um, and uh, Lily asked if you could please repeat your email or I could type it in the chat. Yeah, I can. And I can just say it. it's it's Mark and I spell Mark with a C. It's M-A-R-C dot Puckett, mm -hmm. P-U-C-K-E-T-T -T okay. at, at D-W-R dot Virginia, spelling out the whole word. Mm -hmm. And then the dot G-O-V. So Mark dot Puckett at D-W-R dot Virginia dot gov. All right. Thanks, Mark. I'll put that That's in it. the chat. Yeah. Good. Perfect. And uh, and then very last question uh, before we wrap up: Are there are is there a resource for people to go to um, to see where, like online, where they could see where quail are, or get an idea if there's a population of quail near them? Are there some resources out there for folks? Yeah, I would direct them to to the National Bob White and Grasslands Initiative site. Uh, if they okay. if you just if you type in "bring back Bob Whites" into your search engine, it'll okay. pop up, and you can go to there. Or if you just type "National Bob White and Grasslands Initiative," uh, they okay. have information for every state. Uh, and then again, on our site, the Virginia DWR slash quail, there's there's a lot of information just specific mm -hmm. to Virginia on there, but that National Bob White and Grasslands Initiative is comprehensive for the whole quails range in the, mm -hmm. in the United States. And there's a lot of good uh, habitat management related resources on that site as well. Okay. Uh, look up Bargain Basement Bob Whites. That's one that was done by one of our private lands biologists. It's excellent for like first time quail managers. It's just like a, a really good uh, PowerPoint based tutorial on quail management. Okay, thank you. And I did uh, put that link in the chat, the National Bob White and Grasslands Initiative um, for folks. And so um, with that, I think that we'll go ahead and close for today. Mark, do you have any final words for folks? And no, uh, it was great to have an opportunity to present to so many folks. I mean, we can rarely get more than 40 or 50 at an in-person meeting. So thank you all for the opportunity. And I hope everybody got some useful information from it. But I appreciate yeah. it. 
Wow. Uh, and thank you so much today, Mark, for your time. And, uh, and thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate your time and interest. And Mark, you're just getting all kinds of wonderful feedback in the chat. So yeah, I, I believe your uh, presentation was well received. And I loved how you just put all the habitat requirements into these really easy nuggets of information for folks. So um, if you have any questions, please re reach out to Mark or you can reach out to us at info at blueridgeprism.org and we'll put you in touch with Mark. And with that, I will close um, our summer meeting and thanks again to Mark and thank you Rod thank you. for uh, being here to, to give us an update and to help with some of the Q&A. So thank you all. Have a good day. Yeah. Thank, th thank you, Beth and Mark. Great stuff. Thank you.